welcome this evening uh, to the first in our series of winter talks entitled Discover Braunton, Coast and Countryside. Um, and we're really pleased this evening to be joined by one of our own, John Breed, who's going to be giving a presentation and there'll be um, a chance for questions and answers after John's presentation. Um, so just before we kick off, um, please remember to keep your microphone muted while John's talking. Um, and also um, there'll be a chance, as, as I mentioned, to ask John some questions later. So if you wanted to, you can ask him directly, we'll unmute you, um, or you can ask your questions in the chat. Um, so, um, so as I said, we've got John talking to us this evening about the history and conservation of Braunton Burrows. And John is actually the warden of Braunton Burrows for over 30 years and is still active and working and advising on the burrows. Um, John has, has also been awarded an MBA for his services to conservation as well. And he's a very active member of the Braunton Countryside Centre and has probably um, taken out thousands of people on the burrows um, and around Braunton to tell them about conservation and wildlife. So he's made a, an amazing contribution um, to con conservation locally. So John, I shall hand over to you to start your presentation. Yep, many thanks, Nicola. I should say that MBE stands for Many Bees Efforts. I've always been assisted by lots of volunteers on the burrows. Uh, this first shot shows the beach in a force seven gale by the end of the boardwalk, and then a dunescape further in the dunes. But this carpet of sand moving across the beach is the process which has built the dune system up over the years. If you lay down on the beach, you'd soon be buried at the top end of the beach, as I'll show you later, plants do colonize and start the dune building process. The stick sticking up are part of the groins where there used to be a lighthouse. <clears throat> and here's an aerial photograph of the burrows on the left. Uh, towards the right hand corner, you can see the greens and fairways of the golf links which is the only development on the dune system. Braunton Burrows is unusual and not having much in the way of development on it. And I've left the picture of Horsey in. Not that I'm going to go on to, onto it particularly. You can see this, my mouse is just going over the wall, which stops the seawater from flooding Braunton Marsh. It has topped that wall two or three times already. Horsey mirror on the left here where I've got the mouse. If that wall gives way, Braunton Marsh, all of this will flood and Braunton Burrows could face seawater from the inland and from the sea. Uh, the house here, the White House, the tenants there would be even more cut off. That used to be the old ferryman's cottage when a ferry took people and bits and pieces across to Appledore. The lady who used to live there, now deceased, used to be one of my volunteers, and she remembers Henry Williamson coming and reading some of her, his books to her. And Henry wrote about Horsey and the Burrows. <clears throat> I can see Crow Point at the bottom of the aerial picture. That's a relatively recent geological phenomenon. I've got more pictures of that later. And Airy Point is quite descriptively named and I'll also show more pictures of the flagpole dune. Uh, go into ownership. Uh, there have been many conflicts on the burrows. Some people claim that it's common land. Sorry about that, folks. <clears throat> Another Google Earth image of the burrows. M is where there's the wreckage of an old Matilda tank. A lot of people go out to see that. There's only a few bits and pieces left. People have taken any souvenirs that were small enough to be taken. The question mark towards the southern end of the boroughs, there is reputed to have been a settlement there called St. Hannah's Settlement. And there was even more evidence that there was a small 14 foot by 12 foot chapel there. And I think I saw the foundations of that in the early 80s, since covered in scrub a bit to the right of the question mark. 
that various people have had various theories as to exactly where it is. And at the moment, nobody really knows. By the L, there was an old lighthouse, a blinking billy, I think some people called it. I'll put the cursor by it. The asterisk is where, sorry, the, the X is where the medieval midden site was that was excavated. And it took them a few years later before they wrote up the results because there was only a few sherds of pottery there and a few oyster mussel shells, people being preparing food there. So that might have allied with St. Hannah's settlement, who knows. And the asterisk is Southborough Farm, just here, where a farmer lived for many years, almost like a hermit. At the moment, it's empty, unless it's got squatters in, and it is beginning to subside into the sand. But I think Christie Estates, the owners, are going to do it up in due course. Some old pictures I found on the net. I was amazed to see that we had a lifeboat brought on. I'm not sure exactly where, I presume it was up towards Saunton, but if there was a call out, apparently the crew sailed over from Appledore, then walked up the beach to the station, and then they had to rouse some horses and some men from Braunton to launch the lifeboat. So how many hours that took before sucker came to the poor folks out at sea, I do not know. This is one of the current interpretive boards on the burrows showing a few of the goodies which can be found there. And the right hand panel shows how bare it was in the early years and more vegetation currently. And the coloured lines represent some trails you can walk around and you can get the leaflet locally or in Sandy Lane car park. So it gives some idea of the variety of wildlife which can be found on Braunton burrows. Uh, this sign has since been repositioned since. Mary leading a walk and showing them the old 84 habitat map. I don't know whether you can see within the circle on the left hand image, but there's a diagram across the dunes showing the dunes up and down, but roughly the profile from east to west, you know, it's sort of mounded. And I'll refer to that again when we talk about the water levels in the sand or water tables. This sign was at Sandy Lane Car Park, now it's further into the dunes and some of the locals remember coming to Sandy Lane Car Park and being able to see out to the dunes just after the war. A lot of this scrub is a fairly recent development. The wooden model on the top of the post there represents an old army vehicle from the war. It's called a duck, D-U-K-W, and it's amphibious. I did have a drive on one of those once, great fun. More recent picture, oh, it's a shame it's got the date under the bar at the top. I don't know whether I can get rid of that. No, I'll have to leave that. Well, this was Crow Point in the 2000s, showing Crow Neck. CP is where the Crow Point Lighthouse is at the moment, it's still there, and it's solar powered. L was where there was a lighthouse, and the lighthouse keeper lived on site in a house. And when I came in 79, I just inherited a tower, which was there. And there's the Art Deco Hotel of Saunton Sands. This is the southern end of the American Road. There was always a track on the inland edge of the burrows. But when the Americans came in the war, they straightened up and made a better access for their training. And you can see a few craft around Broad Sands Bay in the shelter of Crow Point. For decades, some of the locals have always sort of gone there for the summer, the old bargees who used to take sand off the beach. Sand was extracted from around Crow Point up to the 1980s. <clears throat> and there are dunes actually forming here. You know, the sand gets blown through and it piles up here. So you've got a mixture of salt marsh and new sand dunes. As Crow Point is gradually shrinking. When I first came, ring plover used to nest almost along the length of the beach. Only two or three nests, some up towards Saunton. And I'm afraid we have lost them. We lost them in 2007. And it's just sheer public pressure. Too many people, too many dogs. 
military training is more erratic. And it's also sad that you see a bird's nest here and man-made litter making a certain proportion of the beach. Ring plovers still fly through, but I'm afraid they've not been known to nest on the burrows for since 2007. As I say, it needs a more wide ranging approach to save a, an area for them. The other thing the ring plovers failed to succeed in was predictably rising tide levels. One nested in where you saw those boats and they put a board under it and gradually drew the nest up the beach as the spring tides got to a higher level. So some of the nests originally used to get washed out, <clears throat> but this one managed to get four young off and it succeeded. Well, it says litter comes in regularly on the beach. Yeah, I don't know what's on the TV, but volunteer groups still regularly collect litter from the beach. I've been involved with many litter clearances. It wasn't unusual to be able to get a great big pile of it on a weekend. Sometimes we used to burn it in our ignorance. Now it's taken away mostly for landfill. And some parties do separate it so stuff can be re recycled. <coughs> Excuse me. Bodies do come in on the beach. This is a porpoise, starfish. I think we have one of the first Kemp's Ridley turtles one Christmas in the 80s. Sea beans come in. There's all sorts of trophies you can find there, but sometimes it's a poor porpoise like this. Dolphins are being washed in occasionally. And my predecessor, pre-79, had quite a large whale, apparently. Cattle, sheep, all sorts, but you won't dwell on that. As I said, in the 60s, the conservation of dunes then was very firmly fixed on fixing the dunes, stopping them from blowing around too much, from blowing into the sea. And this is a massive wall of sand which was bulldozed up. And then it was planted up with marram grass to stabilize it. And the worry was the sea was going to rush through here, go right round here and cut off the lighthouse which was on here. There's crow crow next down here on this picture. So this was quite a, a massive undertaking for its day, chestnut paling fences and a lot of marron grass planting. In fact, in my time, we've exported marron grass to other dune systems where they've wanted to plant marron grass because there is plenty of it on the burrows. <coughs> this is a picture taken from the lighthouse tower. When I came, it was just a steel pipe framework with a fiberglass cabin on the top. And this is quite a historical shot because Yellen Power Station still showing. I've forgotten when Yellen Power Station disappeared, but I used to take lots of photographic monitoring and include the power station as one of the fixed points. So can't rely on anything these days. The walkway is the boardwalk. Most of it is still there, 800 meters along this trackway, some of it boarded and you're through into Broadsands Car Park, which is along here. Uh, the lighthouse tower has since been demolished. In fact, the military had a bit of practice. They blew it. I'm afraid people were hazarding themselves by clambering up and trying to break in. And it was viewed that we'd be liable if anyone fell and broke their neck. Bit of a shame in a way, because we did have a kestrel nesting box on it. <clears throat> Shipwrecks, there's a whole book on shipwrecks on the beach, but the V to the left is where the current Crow Point lighthouse is. And to the right, that rather poor image is a shot of the original lighthouse in which the lighthouse keepers lived. Quite a nice property, but as soon as it was left, people broke into it and started breaking the place up. Otherwise the warden of the day might have wanted to live there himself. And this is the strand line at the top of the beach. Again, it's a very dynamic situation. Everything looks quite stable and very pleasant here, looking up towards Saunton Sands Hotel. And if there's no marine erosion here, you know, the dunes will gain height. And you can see the strand line runs into the embryo dunes, frosted arch in the foreground with the crystals on it looking sugary sea rocket behind, but all this can change overnight almost. There's Saunton Sands Hotel again, and you can see no sign of any strand line. And people say, oh, you've lost your sand, it's been blown away, washed away, but it's 
sit around us on the beach and if there's a storm it gets blown into the dunes and my feeling is that over the years the dunes rise in height having taken the sand off the beach so the next high tides or storm tides are going to cut at the foot of the dunes to try and redress the balance and keep the same amount of material on the beach and with sea level rise the dunes are beginning to lose a little this process is even more dramatic at Woolacombe, where you've got a very steep profile coming straight off the beach. I remember them consulting Nature Conservancy about marine erosion, and the chap told me he'd been too successful catching the sand off the beach. The sea wants it back. So not easy for some folks. But some plants almost like these unstable conditions, like sea stock here, with its very long tap root. And it's important to keep some of these rare plants monitored. Yeah, sorry, some of the text is blocked out, but this was 2004, I think, when we were counting it, when we had just over 4,000 plants, but most of them weren't flowering. It's a, usually a biennial. They were in a vegetative state. And rabbits tend to love this plant. They'll chew at the root and crown it in the winter months. Uh, there was a local doctor and naturalist who wrote a book, Nature Notes on Broughton, and in the 30s he considered that sea stock was finished, there was very little of it. So the reduction in numbers of rabbits after myxomatosis arrived has probably helped the sea stock. So the picture of the Fordune, the inland ridge, and the Fordune ridge that's built up since the 80s, but there was erosion further north, so you get accretion in some areas and a erosion and others. Uh, military training has continued since the war. The military are still active there. All the services have changed there, <coughs> trained there. So don't be surprised if you see special services coming in free fall from 24,000 feet, having jumped out of a Hercules. When they get formed up into Chinook helicopters, these poor guys were dumped on the middle of Dartmoor after that, or they might be taken back out of the beach and shoved back into the Hercules for yet another go. There's uh, one of the ducks, the Second World War vehicles. I remember some army brass came down one day and one of the generals said if he knew these vehicles were here he would have taken them out to the Falklands because they would have been useful out there. Various more modern vehicles have been trialled on the burrows but nothing has been found to match the capabilities of this oldie but I think they've all been pensioned off now. They experiment with all sorts of things. You can see them putting some matting down there on Crow Point. <clears throat> and the military training's as realistic as they can make it. The chap who'd overturned the Land Rover was a little bit stunned, so I had to ask him to move aside so he wasn't in the photograph. He was a bit too stunned to tell me not to photograph it, but. Uh, I've seen vehicles almost tested to destruction out there. They just drive them till they stop because if something's going to fail, they'd rather know about it on Broughton Burrows than somewhere else. <clears throat> and there's any amount of military debris around, concrete walls, which they used to practice demolishing when the sappers had to build it up again and it was blown again. And I remember this group thought we won't be going over to Normandy, but they did, they went to Normandy as well. Metal works all over the place, you've got to be careful. That's an iron picket. They were, there's a corkscrew on the base of this structure, which is screwed into the ground and then barbed wire is put through the loops. And people have found them quite useful because it's quite good quality steel. There's also metal tracking here and there on the burrow to stop vehicles from sinking into the wet sand. And there are some historical monuments now. These concrete platforms, I'll put the mouse on them here, are practice landing craft. When I came to the boroughs, I think there was just these three left with the walls and most of them have been demolished. And I, the military had the head lease on the boroughs in those days. The Nature Conservancy Council just had a sub-lease to run it as a nature reserve. And the military was quite keen to get rid of any military debris they had and blow it up, blow it up. But I had a voluntary war and he'd been an ACK -AC gunner in the war and he brought to notice how important historically these structures were. 
and there's many locals who didn't have a clue what they were, but in the Second World War, when they decided they were going to carry out Normandy landings, they said, hang on a minute, exactly what are we going to do? So they used these structures to practice embarking and disembarking from the landing craft. Everything realistic except seasickness, because they used to fire munitions overhead. <clears throat> so that's the concrete landing craft. There are reenactments every now and then, so don't be surprised if you see some old World War II vehicles going around and light aircraft flying overhead or even the odd Dakota. <clears throat> and every year on June the 6th, there is a sort of memorial service of a sort on the landing craft where this memorial plaque has been placed. And then a series of wreaths are laid, which stay there till the next gale comes along. And the chap on the right of the lower picture was the World War II ACAC gunner who was instrumental in getting these craft, saving them from being demolished, and he also organised putting up the plaque. Uh, there was thought of having the landing craft, the ground consecrated, actually. And there is a little bit of interpretation on site. It's very good quality concrete. There was another interest with it because the lichens are beginning to colonise. And because of the disturbance around them, we've had some of our rare plants like water demander moving in. So now they're his official historic monuments. They should be looked after. There's a more recent June the 6th. That's the son of Norman Dunn on the left and his daughter in the centre paying their respects. The concrete cylinder behind, or I say piston, they were used as wartime defences as well. They were arranged to stop tanks from getting through. And there's also another wall further up in the dunes called the Rocket Wall or Bazooka Wall. That is also an official heritage monument under English heritage. And this map shows the designated preserved areas. And we have had tasks to clear vegetation off of some of these. And as I said, reenactments are very popular. You'll see vehicles running up and down Saunton Beach and this sort of thing going up just underneath Saunton Sands Hotel. I should say the military still have the right to close off the southern two thirds of the boroughs to use live munitions if they wish. They haven't exercised that right recently. I did work directly for the military after English Nature left for a few years and a lot of folks came up and thinking, oh, great place to have live training. But when they realised Many of their staff would actually be on sentry duty trying to keep the locals out. They realise they'd rather queue up and wait for the security of somewhere like Salisbury Plain, and they wouldn't have to worry about blowing anybody up. Munitions do still occur very occasionally. You know, they've decreased over the years, but I've found scores of Second World War mortars, and I'm afraid some people do tend to go around looking for such like. <clears throat> There's a chap called Dick Bass, Richard Bass. He has written a few books on the military history, Spirits of the Sand. So if you're down there on a moonlit night, it might not just be pixies wandering around. Needless to say, this is another reenactment. After the war, this shows the dunes were hosed down with water to find most of the munitions. And apparently there was a very strong pumping station in Canefield, probably not too far from here. A large hose run across the fields out towards the dunes. And on the edge of the dunes, there was a, another high pressure pump and a smaller hose taken out through the dunes to where they had a mobile Bren gun carrier vehicle, semi-track vehicle, and that had a jet jetting nozzle on it, apparently. <clears throat> As they hosed the dunes down, they found out that the minefield was covered by a good 15 feet of sand and some of the wires were corroded. Uh, the hosing detonated some of the mines, but the others were blown with plastic explosives and what have you. Then they bulldozed the mess down to the high tide level to be washed over by the sea. Uh, the Nature Conservancy Council land agent used to live at Instow and as a child he remembers going up to Saunton saw some military chap go down into the dunes with his lady friend and there was a bang and he said a few bits were blown up into the air and that was the end of them. So it was a very dangerous area just after the war. 
being in the military didn't absolve you from getting blown up. Uh, some of the changes and some of the early conservation, my predecessor put great efforts into sand fencing, as you can see, top left, 1976. Chestnut paling and you can just make out some marron grass planting in here. And I remember him saying as he came over the net one side, he found some kids pulling it out again. And in the evenings, at nights, some of the chestnut paling was gratefully accepted for barbecue fire. So I'm a bit of a loser there. I continued a little bit more half-heartedly than he had with the sand fencing. But after Christmas, people wanted to get rid of their Christmas trees. So we used to put them down on the top of the neck. And anything which breaks the force of the wind used to trap the sand. The thing to notice here, there's a survey post here. 82 to 84, the survey post is just behind that chap. And over a couple of nights, a fair bit of crow neck disappeared. And overnight, the sea washed through. Everybody panicked. We oh, must build it back up. Uh, the thing of interest on this, find the mouse again. This is one of the old sand fences. And according to maps, crow neck was originally further out on the beach. The sand still around in the system spread on the beach, some of it washed up river, people panicking, you know, Barnes was going to be flooded. Uh, the landowner didn't like the Nature Conservancy Council for refusing to put any money towards rebuilding Crow Neck. I think my budget for that year was a few hundred pounds. They spent several thousands rebuilding Crow Neck. And as recent events have shown, some of these are mere gestures against changing conditions. So Cronac is indeed quite changeable. And originally, you know, the sand dunes did finish just here. Crow Neck and Crow Point, I think are only about a couple of hundred years old. Henry Williamson claims he remembers Crow Neck being breached and sailing a sailing boat through on a high tide. And this shows how wide Crow Neck was in the 60s, 76, sorry. And then most of it washed away a little bit left after they rebuilt it in 2016. But they brought a lot of stone armoring in, which is saving it from being washed completely away. And as it is today with the stone armoring. Actually, for the coastal process to continue naturally, Natural England would rather that the stone was removed, but I don't think that's going to happen. And to the left, this is the concrete wall I showed you on a previous picture, which was used for demolitions practice. The old lighthouse used to be here, and the boardwalk comes out onto the beach here. Also, the flagpole dune has changed. I'm sorry, we can't see the top of that with this wretched bar. So you can get, get an idea of how it's changed over the years. When I first came, there was just three tracks up to the top, but as the honeypot, everybody sees it from afar and people wander up onto it and it's caused a lot of erosion. Some people used to say, how can you stop your disastrous erosion? And I'm trying to tell them it's not disastrous as far as conservationists are concerned. <clears throat> this is an aerial picture showing the flagpole dune. Something to note on this shot, I think this was about 2004, is that the amount of scrub which has come in on the inland plain. We'll return to that subject later. The black O circles the base of the 1958 flagpole, which you can see in the bottom left shot. But the flagpole has changed since this. This is, I think, 2019. The sand has really been blown inland. The little image at the top shows it's almost like snow on the sand. But the plants are only buried under a relatively thin carpet of sand. And the next shot, later in the year, the greenery has come back through. So it's quite amazing how vital the plants are. I'll go back to the other one, the same sallow bush, just to the left of the Land Rover. So it's not quite the same position, but it's showing the same features of the flagpole dune. And other changes within the dunes, you can see Marron planting on the left a little bit. That's the flagpole pond slack where we had a pond dug in the early 80s. 1982 winter it was flooded. 
And people used to think I was mad when I told them, I've dug a pond in there. But as you can see in 2002, you can hardly see the pond. And the scrub is beginning and it's spread a bit by 2015 and you can see the pond there. We'll return to the subject of ponds later. Yes, Airy Point was aptly named and so was Sandy Lane. It's quite fantastic when you're out there when it's blowing a gale, not very nice on the beach. Not too bad in the Land Rover, but you won't have a shine on the paint for very long, so it doesn't pay to stay and sand's a killer on any machinery. And after a storm, the sun dries the sand and it starts to sl slow down the slope, flow down the slope, almost like dry sugar, quite fantastic. You could hear it tumbling down the slopes on these days. Really phenomenal. <clears throat> yeah, Bronte Burrows is one of the sites that Natural England has set up for long-term botanical monitoring. You know, one of these plots can take half a day or a little more because each and every plant is recorded, each lichen, each liverwort, they try and identify everything, very firmly documented. There is a block in the ground so they can find the site, the exact spot again, and they should be monitored every four years. There's 50 of these sites on the burrows and they're viewed as very important to inform us of changes, which might be due to climate change, increased nitrogen deposition, you know, changing climate and what have you. And this little plane might look like a toy. It's very expensive, battery operated. It's got some very sophisticated cameras and it's programmed to fly on a course, zigzags around, taking photographs and it can fix the botanical monitoring sites and also do a sort of three-dimensional map of the dunes. Very expensive, the technology is a bit beyond me. It can cope with fairly windy days, but it was quite fun helping them out. Uh, water tables, Broughton Burrows is unusual in having a run of water tables going back to readings which were started in 1966. They are continuing, they're a bit more sophisticated today. When I inherited the round it was just some holes in the ground with a pipe and you just dropped a rule down and measured the level down to the base of the tube which sometimes filled in or if it was too wet to get anywhere near it, as it was in some winters, it was recorded as OW over wellies. Things have moved on since with more sophisticated boring equipment and then a pipe with a permeable membrane, a state one is drilled in and hammered into the ground and data loggers are put into the best of the pipes and they record the changing water level, whatever they're programmed to do every half an hour, some every week and so on. Someone comes out with a laptop, connects it up <clears throat> and can draw all sorts of complicated graphs. So they really have got an idea of what the water tables are up to, but they have recorded a half meter drop since 1966. And only in the last two years have the water level returned somewhat. But again, in the summer, it is dry. You know, the seasonal change in the rainfall pattern is quite marked. In 1984, I mentioned about the dunes being roughly dome shaped as far as the lower areas in the dunes are called, we call them slacks. So the water table was domed. I think the slacks in the center of the dunes are 18 feet higher than the slacks towards the inland and the seaward edges. So the water is flowing out of the dunes all the time, flowing out to the beach. But in 84, Braunton Marsh dug out their boundary drain between the burrows and the marsh. I think it got slightly deepened, although that will be disputed. And straight afterwards, I picked up a one meter drop in the water tables. And I followed that drop within a few weeks that had gone right over the top dome of the dunes and went out to the other side. So if the beach levels dropped, it'll drain the dunes. If inland drain more efficiently, it will drain the dunes again. So if Broughton Marsh does get flooded and high tides come in, it might be quite interesting to see what does happen to the water tables. But apparently the freshwater lens is well above the sea level. 
And this shows where the transects cross the burrows from west to east with a subsidiary one down towards the southern end. With more sophisticated gear, they've even put some water table tubes in on some of the high dunes to measure how long the water takes to percolate through the sand. But it's very complex. Some of the water under the dunes, although it might be only be a metre or two down, they've analysed it and they reckon some of it can be up to 20 years old. As I say, some as goes into Brompton Marsh, there is a borehole not far from the burrows and also Saunton extracts water, but they think those effects are not very great. You know, it's a combination of change, rainfall patterns, the evapotranspiration coming off the scrub, which reduces the water levels on the burrows. And in the wet slacks where you might, well, we have found water demander in this slack, but it seems to have disappeared in recent years. This is a bird's foot trefoil which prefers drier conditions and it's come in to an area which was previously a wet slack. So the plant communities are changing on the burrows. Sorry we're diving about a bit, but like I say, it's a complex mosaic of things on the burrows. In the 50s, dune defence works, brushwood fencing. I remember I was parked in Braunton down South Street when I first came to the burrows and after a gale, I remember there was sand on the car, whether it was burrow sand or off the great field, I don't know. But a lot of sand fences put up and marm was planted, but it's a bit of a moonscape in those days. And as you can see after, this is 58, and after a few more years, the sand dunes began to reform and gain in height. Apparently marm grass can cope with about a metre of sand being dumped on it in a year and keeps growing, stimulates it into further growth. It's a tough, wiry plant with a rolled leaf with the breathing pores on the inside of the roll. And if conditions are very severe, it just rolls its leaf up so it doesn't get desiccated, but it seems to be able to cope with sand blasting. Salt and Sands Hotel again, can't get away from it. A shot taken from Saunton Down in 1958. As you can still, there's still a fair amount of bare sand around. The next shot was taken, I think, in the 2004. And you can see the flagpole dune there, but see how much more vegetation cover there is on the dunes. And for a botanist, a worrying amount of scrub on the inland plain. The two crosses mark where the next photograph is taken. Again, that's an unnaturally smooth area. Apparently some areas were bulldozed after the war into an aerofoil shape and then planted with marum under the premise that the aerofoil shape would stop the sand from being blown around quite so much. And it seems to have worked there. And here is one of the marum plantations, high dunes in the background. And the little asterisk is from where the next photograph is taken, 1958 to 1984. And this botanically is quite an ideal situation. One of these carpets of fragrant thyme for which the burrows was famous and some evening primrose, which is a aiding plant technically, but doesn't seem to take over entirely. But lacking enough rabbits to keep grazing what plants did try to come through the thyme. Thyme's too aromatic for them to eat. <clears throat> By 2015, Grasses had taken over from the time, still a few flowers around, and scrubby bushes were moving in. So change was on the way. You mentioned sea buckthorn air earlier. It's quite a nice shrub, and the vitamins are very rich in vitamin C. You can make a, a jam from it. It's a very bitter orange taste. You wouldn't eat many of the berries if you were out there. And this is what my predecessor had to suffer stands a few meters high and four acres in extent in some areas and spreading on a front outwards at two meters a year. So they used to go in cutting the buckthorn and treating the stumps with 245T and other herbicides. And we, when I came, we were still spraying. We found the best thing to use was Roundup or glyphosate, but now there's a shadow on that. Is it carcinogenic? And sea buckthorn is still being controlled. Digging it up is a bit of a waste of time. It's like cooch grass, one bit of root, and it's back again. 
and they use more modern and even more expensive herbicides. But I don't think the plant will ever be eradicated from the burrows. It'll just be controlled from taking over some of the flora. <clears throat> As I say, the rabbits created the turf as we know it in recent historical times. I remember when I gave a lecture in the early 80s, the lady said, oh, the plants were nothing, never like that. In the heyday of the rabbits, they kept everything tight down. So to say, after the pressure of rabbit grazing was released, when myxomatosis affected the population, I would say in the 54, there wasn't much for them to eat, but later on, you know, that's when the effect became known and the scrub started taking over and long grass moving in. I used to do rabbit counts when I was working there, favorite with the volunteers going out with the spotlight and Land Rover. And up to 2004, the population was beginning to rise, but we haven't done any counts since. But I would say the population still lower than pre myxomatosis times because of the effects on the vegetation. You can still see some rabbit grazed air where the floor is kept quite well, but overall there's not enough rabbits on the burrows. I don't think the farmers would want them back because of the immense damage they used to do to the agricultural interest. The old farmers used to say, you'd go into the field at night, clap your hands and the field would run into the hedge. And of course they used to damage the banks of the hedge rows. So some replacement sheep in 1987. We had some sowy sheep on the burrows and they did a grand job as far as I'm concerned, as we'll see later. I'll just get the cursor. I've got the cursor on the nose of my dog of the day. She was a border collie. She'd try and be a bit fierce with the sowies, but she'd nip at their heels if they got she got close to them. But the ram didn't forget. One day he bowled her over twice. So she always gave them a bit of a wide berth. We selected this make of sheep because they're low maintenance, they're fairly wild, they're survivors, they're comparatively dog resistant. They don't round up in a flock if there's dogs around, they tend to split. But unfortunately in the 2001 foot and mouth came and the last of the sower sheep had to be literally shot. Someone had to go around on an ATV on the high dunes and shoot them because we just could not round them up. I kept them semi-tame when I was looking after them. I used to give them a few nuts every day, concentrate, just to maintain contact. But in June, May, June, July, they weren't very interested in that because there were plenty of wild, sweet grasses. Top shot before we moved in with the sheep. The blob is where the lower photographs were taken from. We went in with the machine, cut the low scrub, the low privet, left the bush, and the lower photographs show that the floor came back within three years, which was quite amazing, really, because having taken scientific advice from Nature Conservancy Council, the chief scientist said, oh, it'll take about a decade to get the flora back. But hard grazing with sowy sheep brought it back in three years with a lovely carpet of thyme, bird's foot trefoil, <clears throat> and eye bright visible on the ground. But after a few years, it became evident that the sheep needed reinforcements. There were some coarse grasses, which they tended to leave alone. So we requested cattle grazing on the burrows, but the landowner wasn't too keen. Some trials took place. And now cattle grazing is the only grazing on the burrows, I'm afraid. They're supposed to be sheep, but the grazier brought some sheep in and he fairly soon lost three to dogs, uncontrolled dogs. He'd also lost three of his expensive Red Devon cattle. They were chased by dogs to exhaustion. And apparently there was a well-witnessed event one year when there was a mastiff-like dog attached to the nose of one of the animals and they had to injure the dog to get it off. It just would not let go. So there are problems with uncontrolled dogs, but grazing really is the key to getting the flora back, but it has to be mixed grazing. Cattle grazing has a bit of a double-edged sword, as you'll see here. The X's mark a water germander colony, colony and they've topped the water germander on the right and also trampled it somewhat. But the current thinking is, I'll return to that later, that if there are enough areas created suitable for the water germander, the grazing animals 
shouldn't harm it too much. Changing wildlife, things are changing. When I came to the burrows in the early 80s, I used to note down when I saw badger footprints on the burrows. Now, because of the increased biomass, all the long grass, scrub and other vegetation, there are a few badger sets on the burrows. And indeed, we have seen them on some of our evening and afternoon walks on the burrows. Uh, the top left is the fen orchid, which unfortunately hasn't been seen since 1988. It was always a little erratic on the burrows. And studies of the water levels elsewhere, where it occurs at Kenfig across the Bristol Channel in South Wales, have shown that our water levels are probably about half a metre too low for it. So it may be reintroduced in years to come. Uh, the beachcomber beetle or strandline beetle, you can see on this shot, hasn't been seen since 2007. I'm beginning to think that the dynamic habitat that inhabits the top of the beach is too dynamic for it. You know, these frequent, more frequent winter storms have literally destroyed its habitat. And hedgehogs I have not seen on the burrows for a very long time, possibly influenced by badgers coming back, but badgers and hedgehogs have lived together for a very long time. This particular one was blind in one eye. We used to find him walking around on the edge of the wet slacks, not quite knowing where to go. And when I first came to the burrows, I never found slow worms, but in more recent years with the increased vegetation for them to hide in and find worms and slugs in, slow worms can be found under rubbish on the burrows occasionally. <clears throat> oh, just a picture of a tame fox. I was working up in the north end of the burrows once. We just had lunch and this fox came up to within a few feet of us. Unfortunately, we'd finished all our stuff. It was evidently begging. We threw it an apple core, which it took, and looked at us with disdain. And then someone whistled, and this is what it did. It looked up and it bounded off. Apparently, someone at the golf course had almost conditioned it to come for food. So it was, I won't say tame, it was accustomed to begging. And apparently, there were two of them. Vegetation. Management, as I said, start off hand tools, worked up through everything's been tried on the burrows, even this sort of bush hog machine with the operator controlling it from afar. The problem is it's easy to cut all this vegetation, expensive, I hasten to add, but it's getting rid of the spoil, which is very necessary, otherwise it mulches the soil. And with the plants we want don't come back. If you enrich the soil, aggressive plants like dops, thistles and nettles thrive and the slower growing flowers get ousted again. So all sorts of machines have been trialled. As I say, very expensive machines don't last very long on the burrows. And the latest techniques have been to mow and then come back and bale it. But then of course you've got the problems, what do you do with the round bales? Some people say sell it, but it contains ragwort, so no one wants that. So some areas, well, it was even raked up by hand and we used to burn the piles of grass. Again, bonfires are frowned on a little these days because of CO2 in the atmosphere, but great task for the volunteers. Something primal about having fires. And some of them were dumped under the flagpole dune, which has advanced over them and buried them. Others, we used to dump them in a fire pit and burn a few of them as well. But technically, they should have been taken off site. But if you can imagine the expense of having to cart all these bales off site, take them to a possibly a land disposal, it just was not feasible. And every year I used to have to map the areas which have been mown and saying what percentage of that area has been mown. Can I just make it out myself? 50% there, 70 there, 90 there. So we had 95 there. So we had some idea of how heavy the air had been mown and managed. In the early days, it was we had our own machine, but it got to the stage where it needed contractors in. I also mentioned scrapes earlier, Margaret Teller's scrape. This is a more recent one in 2014. This is down in Old Met Slack, near Pebble Slack. There used to be a water demander colony here and in here. And we took this blowout up into the dunes, hoping to get a 
another flagpole type scenario going. So all the communities of plants would keep going there as well. Sea stop was very quick to move into this scrape. Here's a previous scrape. This is long slack, not a very imaginative shape, but this is one of the early scrapes of carpet of Bog Pimpernel again, and the Royal Horticultural Society were viewing some of the eph ephemeral floor there with the opium poppies, which were there for a year or two, and then they're gone. So some of the plants are ephemeral indeed. I gave up this slack for many years. Water Commander didn't appear, didn't appear, didn't appear. And then all of a sudden, Rupert Hawley, who is the current warden, found it there a few years ago. So it can take a decade or more before some of the target species return to some of the managed areas. And more scrapes, vegetation being bulldozed into or dozed up into a pile, usually burnt if not buried and covered with fresh sand. And also we've created a, a new pond here. This is baby donut. This is donut pond, which the military created in the mid seventies. So altogether 33 ponds have been created on the burrows. Uh, eight were inherited from the war. Some of them literally dry out in the summer months, the maximum difference between winter and summer water levels can be in the order of two meters. So it's quite a, a drastic change. So some years the orchids are flooded into the summer months and hardly come through. Other years, I remember once in May, they were wilting because it was dry, a real drought. And these are the areas which have been scraped. This is in pebble slack, another slack further. So extensive areas have been scraped, but a few years later you come back, you'd hardly know you've been there because the vegetation does cover them over so quickly. <clears throat> Looking at Crow Neck here, Crow Point, Broad Sands Car Park, but you can notice the power station has gone. Ponds really have enriched the wildlife value of the burrows. Some of the purists say you shouldn't have ponds on Broughton burrows because the wind will only blow dry sand, but as an enhancement, it's good. Top left, you've got swallows skimming over the partridge slack pond. And this is Margaret Teller's slack at the bottom where we've taken a, a group in. We've had pond dipping days. So it's the fascination of splooshing around in the water. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, introductions in, this is a photograph not taken by me. The great crested newt was brought to the burrows in 1980. They had thousands of spare at Ainsdale, Southport near Liverpool, and they've spread and they're over most of the ponds on the burrows. Indeed, we have got a project to do some monitoring and involve Peter and people in monitoring them. The best thing is to go out at night with a torch. We can't do it under COVID at the moment. And also you can make up traps which can trap the newts and get an idea of the population. <clears throat> but the great crested newt's a magnificent beast here. It's nearly six inches long. And here is the more common palm, palmate newt with its palmated hind feet. And it's got a filament on the end of the tail. So say with one pond, I remember counting 80 crested newts in it one night. And I think went back the following night with a friend and we were down to 24 and there were footprints in the pond. I think a heron had taken some. But to most species, they're a bit distasteful for the warty skin. It gives off a toxic substance. So most creatures would not feed on them. <clears throat> More pond life. Water stick insects are a recent discovery. A, a lad found one in one of our ponds and they've been found in others since. Water scorpion is fairly common and not everybody's too keen on seeing leeches, but they, they are in some of the burrows ponds. Dragonflies, I think we've got 18 species with a one discovered only a couple of years ago. And quite common on the burrows. This is the emperor dragonfly laying eggs and the nymph skin on the left. <clears throat> and here's another scrape. And some of these scrapes, we want to leave them to see what the plants do, let them recolonize. 
And here we've got a crystal wort, one of the liver worts in it. This came, it was only there for a year or two, then it fizzled away. So that's how ephemeral some of the plants can be on the burrows and the management going in and creating scrapes, although it might seem like destruction, is essential to keep some of these rare plants going. Concludes as this tiny little thing called petalwort. The burrows contains a substantial population of it. You can see how small it is from the grains of sand and the amber sandball snail, or it should be sandball amber snail, which I'm afraid changed its Latin name. Well, this is a tiny little thing, three or four millimeters long. And once the vegetation gets going, it's lost from that area. It feeds on algae on the soil mostly. And you get hunters on the bare sands. It's the sand dune tiger beetle at the top with these fearsome jaws and the more common green tiger beetle, the amorous couple bottom left. But they really are the sort of wolves of the insect world, very rapid. They run very fast over the ground and fly if they're disturbed. Uh, 36 species of butterflies on the burrows. Silver studded blue. Some people do wonder whether it was a correct record or not, but that was the last record. And the marble white was first found in 74. It will only come in if there's enough grass for it. In the heyday of short grass, it wasn't attractive to marble white. Walls quite like open areas. They like some warm sand to sunbathe on. Small heath is still relatively common, but feet on, on fine grasses. This is a quote I saw recently about insect declines. And the small blue has been erratic in latter years on the burrows. We lost it in 2004 after a drought frazzled the food plants. We thought of reintroducing, but we decided not because the food plant was unreliable. Then all of a sudden that reappeared. And I think that it probably came from the golf links. So hopefully when we're allowed out, We'll go looking for it and see if it's still on the burrows. burrows. But fantastic little beastie, really tiny butterfly. And the Latin name is quite apt, I think. Indeed, some woodland species have moved in in the last 15 years, which echoes some of the changes. Silverwash fertilities are fairly widespread in North Devon, so they'll pass through. The White Admiral I'm a little suspicious of because it's not usually found this far west, it's too damp for it. People do rear butterflies these days and let them go. Swallowtails have been seen in Barnstable, for instance, and some other bare sand fungi, winter stalk bill and the stinkhorn, which can be smelt from a fair distance. Uh, sand toe flax is only found on Broughton burrows in this country. And it was sown here in 1894, apparently, but has been here ever since. And where the habitat is open enough, you can get quite large displays of it. It's an ephemeral annual. Sometimes it can turn over two, maybe three generations in a year. In the background, you can see the spreading carpet of privet, which will oust it if it's not controlled. <clears throat> a lovely show of Viper's Bugloss. I remember making a scrape here. This came in on the scrape the very next year. And that year, a, a local lady who tended towards the sort of tree hugging brigade, if we were cutting things on the burrows, sent a complaining letter to the local paper saying about all the destruction on the burrows. So I sent this photograph in and saying, this is the result of the destruction. She was magnanimous enough to say, never have been so pleased to be proved wrong, but hasn't written since. Uh, sand lizards were introduced in 2004. That's the right hand images. I put a common lizard in to show how they differ. I think the population has spread somewhat, but it is sparse. And as yet, we haven't been able to monitor them properly. So that's another project we hope we can get off the ground in due course. So we can get a better idea of how widespread they are and how common they are on the burrows. But we do find them occasionally on guided walks. If it's a hot sunny day, you'd have to be out very early in the morning or later in the day because they will then seek cover. But in its breeding season, May and June, or mating season, I should say, the male has lovely green sides. 
and the female, as you can see, she's carrying eggs. She needs to lay them in some warm sand where they can develop and hatch out. Snakes are a favourite of mine. To help the grass snakes, we used to put a dung pile in the dune so the females could come and lay their eggs, which would be hatched later in the early autumn. And I think in the best year, because we used to take the dung away after, we had 1,700 eggs which had hatched. Another year it was so wet, the dung pile got cold and most of the eggs died, unfortunately. And another favourite of mine, adders. I think this picture has been fairly widely published. Uh, I think the most adders I've seen in a day were was about 11 on the burrows, but they have become rarer. There are skin diseases affecting reptiles and even more seriously amphibians, so there's a lot of concern over the decline of some of the reptiles. Uh, back to the flora. As I said, if you leave your lawn, it will soon get covered in rough vegetation. Brambles beginning to move in there with the pyramid orchids and ladies' bed straw. And you've got a lovely carpet of wildflowers on the left, again, all under threat. Pyramid orchids, bed straw again, more privet. <clears throat> Privet's strangled the flora out, and it's only taller things like the stinking iris, which can poke its way up through. But only a couple of years ago, we were finding pyramid orchids were stretched and almost a half a metre high coming up through some of the privet, but in the long term, they would definitely get ousted. This is a sort of ideal proportion of habitat, flower rich turf, some moderate grass in the background and some scrub. But we don't want any one habitat to take over. This is in pebble slack. A few more views of the flower rich turf showing very well again, scrub in the background. Rest harrow, the pink pea like flowers. Ragwort, which many people decry, but it's quite a good wildlife plant with up to 70 insects which can use it. This is near the flagpole dune. And you can still see the flagpole on the top here. Some alien plants are in the burrows. This is red valerian, which isn't too bad as an invader. It's quite a good nectar source and a photographer being photographed here. This is on the small blue side. And the evening primrose, quite a spectacular plant. I read once that the seeds were worth 900 pounds a ton, but it would take you a long time to get that many. And when we cleared a woodland and left the core of it, the evening primrose was in the very next year. Quite a spectacular plant. This is in pebble slack with the thyme and rest harrow. This is in 93, not far from pebble slack. The glaucous looking plants, that's, that's sea stock, but I'm afraid the nuisance plant is here, brambles. And they've spread quite a lot since. Sausage lichen, again, we're very worried about this. It has this usually species which grows in the trees. In the early 80s, the British Lichenological Society visited and said Braunton Burrows was the best place in the country to find this lichen growing on the ground. But it has declined somewhat, whether it's atmospheric nitrogen deposits enriching it or it's not being grazed hard enough by small animals because the heavy cattle might trample it too much, we're not sure. So there's not so much sausage lichen as there used to be. And of speciality on the burrows, the scrambled eggs lichen, we have to keep open airs for that. But again, it could be many years before they're stable enough for the lichen to get going. And the fragrant organ was first seen in 1988. And we only had eight specimens a few years later, they went up to 400. But since cattle have been grazing, I'm afraid they tend to top them. So the cattle, we'd lock them out of the southern area in the summer months, but sometimes that's not always feasible. And round leaf wintergreen was first seen on the burrows in 1958. It didn't do much for a few years, then it spread all over the burrows. And it's nearly always growing in wet slacks near some creeping willow. And this 
drop work was first found in 2014. It's been seen a few times since. And there is a radio program once about the aphrodisiac qualities of orchid bulbs because of the resemblance to a certain part of the male anatomy. And this is what we were finding. We thought people were going out and collecting the bulbs. And the volunteers and I we were incensed. We were looking for the culprits. We did find the culprits in the end. Rooks, crows and jackdaws. We were digging them out and eating the double orchid bulb. I can't answer for aphrodisiac qualities, but it certainly seemed to work for the birds. These are unusual formations of black sedge, and we think this sort of rounded globular effect is a response to changing water levels, you know, the dramatic changing water levels, because they seem to have fizzled out a bit since. This is in Marigold Hollow near one of our good ponds. There's a long history, as I said, of educational use. My predecessor used to try and take the teachers around and tell them everything and let them take the kids. But of course, there's nothing like the, as you say, the farmer's boots on the site. So Mary and I have always taken as many groups around as we can, whatever they want, school groups, universities, specialist natural history or whatever. <clears throat> and in one year, that's how many groups we took around with at least 1900 people. I remember taking out some wolf cubs one night, one evening, and remember telling them about the old Matilda tank. They forgot wildlife, they wanted to see the scrap iron. So there's all sorts of interests. And here is a teacher telling them how the landing craft were used in the war, you know, demonstration. And the Friday evening walks, Mary leads and I help have become a tradition in the last few years, but I hope we can get them going again. Enjoying the bee orchids, which should be there in June. Our specialist groups come, sorry the text is out, but this is the Bumblefee Conservation Group having a trip on the burrows and they did find some rare bumblebees. We had an evening talk back here and did the course indoors. So the more specialist groups come to the burrows, the more rarities seem to crop up. This is one of the cardabees on the left, banded cardabee. Uh, this willow doesn't look very much, but this particular willow is unique to Braunton Burrows and it's a triple hybrid. Many people tend to say, so what? But other people say this might be a sign of the future if the climate's changing and doesn't suit some of the original plants, some of these new hybrids might find things very suitable. We've also got a double hybrid there, which we've got a few more trees of, but it needs a specialist to be able to tell it apart. <clears throat> Some questions for the future. We're nearly at the end of the talk, folks. We are quite worried, well, everybody's worried about climate change, apart from storminess. Sea level rise could result, as I said earlier, in a smaller burrows and sea on two sides. Rainfall patterns have changed. This has been picked up from the water table monitoring. More rain in the winter, not enough in the summer. I always fancy that plants grow far more vigorously now than I remember them growing in my younger days. Brambles, for instance, they seem to grow much more vigorously in the 80s onward than many, many years ago. Nitrogen deposition is a bit more difficult to measure, whether it's from local fertilizer, from you know vehicle fumes, we don't know, but it, it is in the atmosphere and it could be tipping out some of the lichens. Dogs are a more obvious nuisance on the burrows, apart from their enrichment, from their fouling. There is chronic widespread, widespread disturbance on the burrows. It might look peaceful, but there's nowhere on the burrows where somewhere in a day a dog probably won't run through, which means there's a Skylark's nesting site denied because the birds just won't nest if they're disturbed. And also deer moved in after foot and mouth. As soon as it was opened up in August, people were ringing up saying, well, we've got deer on the burrows. So you say they won't be there very much longer if people are there with dogs. <clears throat> Indeed, we had some venison once because I had to go down and pick up the corpse of a deer which had been recently killed, one of the roe deer. 
And for the future, there is some heritage lottery funding targeting sand dunes, nine heirs. It's not all coming to Braunton Burrows, but there is a project on the burrows. Rupert Hawley and Plant Life are running it. And these are the aims. Some of these almost interlock and complement one another. But the programme of adult and youth volunteering will involve others, hopefully to get some monitoring done, as I said, sand lizard and crested newts. So at that I'll finish the talk and thanks for watching and I've got to press the button to stop share. So if there's any questions, fire away. Thank you, John. Um, so if anyone would like to answer, ask a question, sorry, if you'd like to use the um, raise your hand icon and then I can unmute you. Or alternatively, if you'd like to put your question in the chat and I can read it out for you. I'll let you referee, Nicola. <laughs> There's quite a few of you, so I will try and see if anyone's putting there. Or, or if you want to, you can physically wave at me if you don't know where the raise your hand icon is. Ah, Pat and Peter Bunch. Can I, can I just... Yes, you're unmuted. Can I just ask, uh, John, what the difference is between a slack and a scrape? Uh, the slacks are the technical jargon term for the wet areas in between the higher dunes, which flood some winters. A scrape can be in one of those slacks or it can be on a dry ground. A scrape is something we've created. <clears throat> a slack is a natural creation. The dunes build up. Basically, there's three ridges on the burrows, but they've coalesced in some areas and bars have come across. So you get a high ridge, then you get a sheltered area, low slack, then another ridge. Theoretically, if there's endless sand, they could build on out to the sea. But, you know, that's how we've got the current situation. So okay. I hope this, that answers your question. Thank you, it did, yes. Thank yep. you. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. Um, and there's one, um, I can't, who's that from? <coughs> Just let me go up. So, oh, Ken Rutherford was asking, um, when were bee orchids last seen, John? I think we found some last year, didn't we, Mary? Bee orchids. But, but they were very poor. Some years they're much better than others. Yeah, it was too, a bit too dry for them. I see the one about dog nuisance and fouling. I've been on the burrows many years and I've yet to arrive at a satisfactory answer. We've had public meetings here with inviting the dog owners in, some of them wanting to lynch us. I think the most practical thing to do would be to dedicate it an area for dogs, you know, and just let them use that area. But trying to control dog owners is not really feeling if you can persuade them and get some sympathy maybe but the joy of the burrows for many people even the army commandant at Fremden camp is letting their dogs run free but to the wildlife it's a bit disastrous and locally to the floor it's just as disastrous with the eutrophication so if anyone's got any other ideas be very welcome no answer has been found as yet, and I'm assuming there's other areas in the country would be delighted if we could find one. I must admit there was a time when I hoped I was going to find Toxicaria on feces in the car park because I would have publicised that and maybe frightened people off. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, John. Um, and there's a question in the chat here from Jamie. Are there any sheep grazing anymore or any plans to introduce them? Um, and what are the best grazers for flora? Uh, well, originally I'd say 90% sheep and maybe 10% cattle, but at the moment I don't know whether sheep are going to be brought back in. The current grazier is not going to risk them because of uncontrolled dogs. So it is true to say because of uncontrolled dogs on the burrows, we can't institute the correct management. Well, I shouldn't say we because I'm retired, but I still help out. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah. Robin, you've got a question. You've got your hand raised. Do you just want to unmute yourself? Yeah, okay. Hi, hi, hi there. Hi, John. Um, you mentioned the um, um, the move to plant up the dunes in the 1950s. Was, was that a direct response to, um, 
Second World War usage, which would have created extensive bare areas. Oh, yes. If you remember those photographs, there were ex an exceeding amount of bear sand blowing in onto the agricultural fields. And the War Department, as they were more descriptively known in those days, you know, were charged with planting up vast areas of the burrows. Right. OK, OK. So Thanks. the ethos is totally different now, as, you, as the talk showed. Yeah, well. Great. Thank Thanks. you for that question. Has there anyone else got another question? Oh, Stephen's got a question. Um, have, do you have any idea how many dogs get bitten by adders every year? Uh, not the, quite the a local few. vets might. I think by the end of May one year, I think nearly a dozen have been bitten. And I used to get it in the neck. People were saying you shouldn't have vermin like that on the burrows. And my response was, as far as the wildlife's concerned, the vermin comes on two legs, some of it on four. I <laughs> even put a warning notice up in Sandy Lane car park. You know, you run the risk of your dog being bitten if you let it run free. But the lady on the car park didn't want to frighten off her clients and she promptly took it down. <laughs> My own collie was bitten twice on the burrows. Cost about 80 quid to get vet's attention in case of kidney, liver failure and what have you. So oh. it, it, is, it is a risk if you're on the burrows. And of course, a dog doesn't let you know. You only find out when the dog's beginning to stagger or beginning to fail. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think I don't think anyone else has anyone else got any questions. There's no more questions in the chat. Otherwise, we'll round it up. So um, thank you very much, John, for a fantastic talk. It's so right. great that we've got your um, uh, oral and um, sort of pictorial history record yeah, of all you. you know the, all the changes and how dynamic the the dunes are and um, what a contribution you've made uh, to the Br Bronson Burrows locally so uh, thank you very much for that um, before we sign off um, a reminder that we've got um, another five talks John mentioned earlier um, we've got military historian Richard Bass who's going to be doing a talk about why the Burroughs were so important to um, in the lead up to World War in, in World War II up to lead up to D-Day um, so I hope you can join us for that and some of our other talks that we've coming up. Um, so please uh, join me in a round of applause for John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. Hopefully see you all again soon.